education used to be the job of parents in churches and one-on-one -on -one tutors. That started to change about 200 years ago in a region of Germany called Prussia. The nation had just been defeated by Napoleon's army and they were like, okay, we need to figure something out so that this doesn't happen again. So the goal was to train a generation of soldiers that were ready for war. So they would put uh, suddenly for the first time kids together. We would group them by age. They would put a squadron leader, which would be quote unquote the teacher. And everyone was learning the same thing. They created the basis of our modern education system. Specialized buildings, which were the schools, mandated attendance, um, a curriculum, the teacher in front of the, the classroom, etc., etc. And the model worked really well. So Prussia built one of the strongest fighting forces in the world. And so their model started to spread across the globe like wildfire. And then around the 1960s, after World War II and after the Industrial Revolution, it started to highlight the importance of a manufacturing capacity for a nation, right? And so the United States led the second sort of movement in the world of education history, and the theme was standardization and efficiency. So the goal of education changed from training a lot of soldiers for, you know, to fight for war, to training managers for corporations and people to work for the assembly line. So let's say that Anna was queen of the world and you had absolute authority to change the education system into whatever you want it to be. What would you change if you could? Um, definitely, um, I would add diversity of approaches. So the whole you know, issue, the biggest issue with our current education system is that it's just one way for people to succeed, quote unquote, right? Because I would even argue that that's a way to actually prepare people for the future and to succeed in the future. But um, and it works for the minority of kids. And so I think that we need to open up the options and broaden up the approaches that we have right now. So parents can actually make decisions about what they want to do with their kids. Right. And for this to happen, we also need to and um, we need more resources in order to um, broaden up all these alternatives and make them accessible for parents and obviously have a place where parents can put their kids during the day because schools serve as a babysitting center, right? Um, and so for this to actually work. But the main thing that I would change is not just one way to do things, not just one way to assess students, not just one way to teach, but rather diversity of approaches. Now, what do you think is the realistic future? Because it's, it's, it's so easy to say all these things, but as we know, we've been trying for change for years and I'm personally optimistic that things are going to get better moving forward. But what do you think the realistic future of the school system is, maybe in the next 10, 20 years? So I don't think the traditional education system is going anywhere. Um, I think that it's been, you know, it's, a, it's an established identity that has a lot of bureaucracy and process. And there's a lot going on there that um, and it's a very old structure. So I don't really think we're going to get rid of it anytime soon, at least. However, I am very optimistic of all the people that are working in the alternative education space. I'm very optimistic with all the advances that we're seeing with technology and the new digital tutors that are starting to emerge and that are covering the hardcore academics in a very efficient and effective way. Um, and so I think that the future is going to look like less time spent in um, these institutions and more people actually pulling their kids out of school covering the academics with this digital tutors in an hour or two a day and then freeing up the rest of the day for kids to actually engage in things that are like sports or project-based learning or you know going out and learning in the community from museums or spending time with other kids or enrolling in the kind of programs that teaches them the soft skills that they actually will need in order to thrive in the future right problem solve how to work collaboratively but real collaboration not the kind of um, you know, wishy-washy collaboration with, we see in school projects in school, um, how to, you know, fail constructively, how to make decisions, you know, under pressure. All these soft skills are super important. We're not really teaching them properly in school. And there are programs like Synthesis, which is a startup that I'm part of, that's doing a great job teaching them. So I think that kids are going to now have the time and the space to enroll in this kind of things because they're not going to be stuck in school from eight to three. Um, I think that um, we we're going to need more like I said earlier, um, places where parents can actually drop their kids off um, and they can work in this thing. So, for example, I'm an investor in one called Moonrise, which is incredible. It's this beautiful spaces they started in Atlanta where parents can drop their kids off from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And they're facilitators. They're like adults that are watching the kids and kids are working on all sorts of different things. The spaces are beautiful. They have food. They have an outdoor area. And so it's still a place where parents can 
drop their kids off. They're safe. They're interacting with other kids. So they're not missing on that social component. There's mixed age grouping, but every kid is working on something different. So I think that we're going to need more and more of these spaces around, you know, the country and around the world. Um, and I think that that's going to facilitate a lot of this alternative education programs and solutions that are emerging. Yeah, I mean, I can speak from personal experience. I feel like even the social interactions that you have in school are as valuable as the actual lessons that you're learning. And I'm a little nervous, especially with this whole remote learning thing that we're losing that social interaction. And that you kind of need to go through that social interactions when you're in school because you, you learn a lot about life through those. Um, and so what is it now about the school system that fails to meet our kids' needs? What, what are we doing wrong right now? So let me first address your concern because yes. it's a very valid concern that a lot of parents have. But what I found by actually being in the system myself now is that, you know, when I was a teacher a few years ago, um, is that, you know, when you and I went through school, we had more opportunities to socialize, even though we were pretty restrained, right? You can't quite talk while there's a lecture. And, you know, again, teen projects are very rare. And, you know, you kind of socialize in the hallways and that kind of thing. But recess was pretty longer back then. Now, recess has been cut back universally. So many schools have 15 minutes of recess, which is the time where kids are, quote unquote, socializing. Um, then, you know, even in lines, in the hallways, everything's so structured and kids can't talk and this and that. I asked one of my students um, a few years ago, I was like, well, when do you think that you're actually socializing? And she would tell me, you know, in the bus. And this is a more common answer nowadays than what it was, you know, when you and I went to school. So really for parents that are like, oh, I sent my kids to school to socialize, it, it's an invitation for them to rethink and really see what's going on because actually the time for kids to socialize in school is being really minimized. So if that's the reason why you're sending your kids to school, I would really reconsider that. And so that's one thing. Then there's also a myth around this idea that homeschoolers, and I'm not saying that I advocate for homeschooling for everyone, like I wouldn't want to homeschool my kids, for example, but there are a lot of options in the middle between homeschooling and traditional school. And so it's also a myth that homeschoolers don't socialize. Um, you know, there's, there's, they actually, I would argue that they socialize in ways that resemble more the real world because they're interacting with people of different ages, people in the community, and they have more time to actually socialize. And so um, not because you are in the school setting and surrounded by kids means that you're socializing. So that's one thing that I've realized by, you know, coming from within the system. And so when it comes to what's wrong with the way we're doing things, you know, I could, you know, I could talk about this for hours, but I'm going to kind of pinpoint a few of the ones that immediately come to mind. So one is this over-focus on the content, right? The education system was built was 200 years ago for a very different time and purpose. And the curriculums that we've built throughout the years, if you look at the content that we're teaching, is pretty much the same. Obviously, we've added a few things, we've added a few skills and this and that based on the Common Core standards. But if you look at the content, so much of it, you can't, you know, it's not the kind of common knowledge that we would have today for most professions in the real world. And, you know, two thirds of the kids going through grade school right now will end up doing jobs that haven't been invented yet. And therefore, the content that we're teaching them is less relevant than the skills that they will need to thrive in a world that's constantly changing and that's very chaotic. Right. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. And so teaching from a very certain curriculum that's a one size fits all curriculum doesn't quite make sense. That's one thing. The other thing is that we know that for learning to stick, kids need to understand the relevance of what they're learning and they need to be able to apply it right away to the real world. And again, a lot of the content that we teach them is just in case they ever need it in the future. And sometimes that future never comes. Like, I'm sure you can think of a lot of stuff that you learned in school or you were exposed to in school that you still haven't used. And yet there's so many things that you did not learn that you wish you had learned because you actually need it in the real world. And so I think that this over-focus on delivering content as if kids were like sponges that absorb everything and retain everything is a really wrong misconception. Then the other thing is if they can't apply to the real world in the next 14 days, which is usually the case, they're, you know, after the test, they never use that information, then knowledge decays really quickly. And so everything that they memorized goes out the other way, and it's just a big waste of time. So that's one big one. Then the other thing is that we know that learning is interconnected and that kids and adults need to understand how different subjects and how topics fit within other areas. In school, the way that we've arranged it is we segregate topics by subject, right? So it's every 45 minutes, they ring the bell, you have to close social studies and you open science. You close science after 45 minutes, you open reading. This causes a big disconnection for kids because they are, they have, you know, after 45 minutes, maybe 
they haven't even started, you know, you, you're starting to catch their attention and then you ask them to close it and move on to the next thing. And this constant interruption is not good for knowledge retention. This constant interruption is not good for, you know, to spark the curiosity that kids actually need. We need to let them dive into subjects until they are like, okay, I'm ready to move on. And so it's really hard, of what, obviously, to do this in school when you have 30 kids and you have to cover all these huge curriculums and um, for this test. So that's another big thing, like the way that we're delivering this content. Then this focus on having like the teacher as sort of the center of the stage and the fountain of wisdom, when in reality, um, knowledge is constructed together. And so there are other schools. By the way, when I talk about the traditional school system, I mean like the very traditional schools. I am very much aware that there are wonderful schools that are doing things differently, that are actually adapting to the current needs that we have, but those are the, the minority. So I'm talking about like traditional schools in general. Um, and so when students actually get to direct and construct their own learning, then the results are very, very different. But there's no space for that in school, right? In school, the lessons are already predisposed. The teacher's the one that knows, you know, we're teaching you this, we're covering this material this way, I'm assessing you this way. So kids have very, very little choice and autonomy. Two things that we know and that research backs up that is very essential in order for kids to actually learn. And so we've removed kids from the most, you know, natural elements of learning. Um, and that's a big problem, right? We're not just, we're not doing things effectively. Then another huge one is if you look at what kids need in order to develop both mentally and physically, you know, to their full potential, they need to be moving a lot. They need to be running. They need to be spending all their energy until they're exhausted. And we are putting them in this constrained environments that go against everything we know about kids. We're telling them to sit up. We're telling them to be quiet. We're telling them not to fidget. And when they fidget, we make them feel bad because we're like, you know, stop moving. Why are you moving so much? Why are they moving so much? Because they haven't had the chance to release all the energy that they need to, right? That's how they develop. And so we've put them in these environments that go against everything we know about kids. And then when they start moving and when they start doing the things that are the natural outcome because of what we're doing, then we're like, oh, they must have ADHD or, oh, they're the troublemakers or, oh, you know, they have this, this learning disability. So we're putting all these labels in kids that may or may not be true. And I would argue that most of the time they're not true. It's just that we're putting them in a very, you know, very strict environment that go against them. Um, and so kids are, as a result, believing all these labels that we put them and they become self-fulfilling prophecies, right? And so a lot of kids, a lot of what we do in school is that we focus on remediating kids' weaknesses instead of actually helping them find the things that they're really good at and doubling down on those and finding what their strengths are and the things that they love doing and how they can actually add value to the world and what makes them different from everybody else. No, in school, we're so focused on Everyone trying to fit in, everyone trying to do the same thing the same way. If we all believe an idea is true, then it must be true. We're not teaching kids how to question things. We're not teaching kids how to think for themselves. We're not teaching kids how to figure things out when there are no instructions. We're not teaching kids how to fail constructively and how to take risks and what can you learn from that, which are, again, all fundamental skills for whatever it is that you want to do in life. And so I could go on and on, but those are some things that come to mind um, that we're not doing right. How do we get here? How, how did, why, why is the school system the way it is based on maybe the history of maybe in the past hundred years? How do we get to this point? Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, education used to be the job of parents and churches and one-on-one -on -one tutors. That started to change about 200 years ago in a region of Germany called Prussia. So um, the nation had just been defeated by Napoleon's army, and they were like, okay, we need to figure something out so that this doesn't happen again. So that was the first time that, uh, you know, a nation took it upon themselves to build, to start educating the population so that they could have a different outcome. So the goal was to train a generation of soldiers that were ready for war. So they would um, put uh, suddenly for the first time kids together. We would group them by age. They would put a squadron leader, which would be, quote unquote, the teacher. And everyone was learning the same thing. So it was the it's sort of the ba they created the basis of our modern education system, specialized buildings, which were the schools, mandated attendance, um, a curriculum, the teacher in front of the, the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. And the model worked really well. So Prussia built one of the strongest fighting forces in the world. And so their model started to spread across the globe like wildfire. And then um, around the 1960s, after World War II and after the Industrial Revolution, 
it started to highlight the importance of a manufacturing capacity for a nation, right? And so the United States led the second sort of movement in the world of education history, and the theme was standardization and efficiency. So the goal of education cha changed from training a lot of soldiers for, you know, to fight for war to training managers for corporations and people to work for the assembly line. And so, um, again, this whole notion of putting everyone through the same curriculum and putting everyone, th you know, the same subjects and ringing a bell every 45 minutes and, you know, anyone that doesn't fit the mold is labeled as defective. So it's sort of the same assembly line model that we used for cars and clothes and bullets. We used it for education. And so at the beginning, it worked in the sense that you were educating, you know, more people learned how to read and how to write. But then what happened was that we started adding all these standardized tests in order to measure progress, right? Sort of the way that, you know, if you would go to a car mechanic and they would try to see if the pieces are working together. So that's sort of the goal of standardized tests back then around the 1960s. And so it was they were meant to kept to keep schools accountable and make sure that things were, quote unquote, working. And I think that that was OK, you know, having some sort of baseline to see where kids are in certain um, subjects. The problem is that fast forward to 2023 and schools run around this standardized tests. And so they've sort of become the whole point of education. And that's where I think that, you know, we started to go sideways. But if you look at, you know, the purpose, going back to your question of of the education system, it was it was meant to create, again, soldiers to fight for war. And they were very good at that. And then people to work at, at corporations and factories. We no longer need those, right? And and obviously we do, but but that's what some specialized schools are for. But for the rest of the population, we need, you know, citizens that can think for themselves, that can carve their own paths, that can problem solve, that can work collaboratively to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And our system was not designed for that. And I would argue that they're actually doing the opposite of what we actually need nowadays. And you look at the rest of the world and all the other industries and how much they've evolved in the past 200 years, and yet you look at the education system and it's pretty much the same. Yes, we've added a bit of technology over here and over there, but the outcomes and the process and the way we're delivering content is pretty much the same. Why do you think we're so hesitant to change then? If we know if we know what we're doing is is maybe not the best, why why are we so stuck in this like standardized tests? Like you said, like that schedule of going to class to class, what, what's holding us back from making that change? So there's a lot of bureaucracy when it comes to the education system, and there's a lot of politics involved. You know, every four years, what would change government? Like a lot of it changes. So it really depends on who's up there in power. Um, and it's it's an entity that, again, has been around for so many years, and, and many people never stop to question it, you know? So the way that we innovate is by questioning the status quo and seeing what we can, you know, what no longer works and what we could do better. There are two things that I've detected here. One, a lot of people say, oh, it worked for me. Like I turned out fine. So why change it? Right. Those people haven't quite stopped to think about, you know, it's not about just, you know, fine. Think about all the things that you learned that you never used, and think about all the things that you haven't learned that you actually need. And think about the most important years for someone is your childhood years. Do you think that cramming them into this structured buildings for 12 years, you know, five days a week for seven hours a day, is that the best time to spend kids' childhood? Are we churning out kids that are happy, that know what they love, and that, you know, know how to contribute to society? The answer is no, right? And so for the majority of the people. And so we, we need to do something different. It's really, really, really hard, which is why I left the school system and started to find, you know, you start to work in the alternative education system because it's really hard to make this entity go, you know, do things differently. And so when you try to standardize something and when you try, you know, you take it upon, which I guess was an original good goal, like, oh, I need to educate all of society. I need to, you need to start to implement certain methods for organization, for order, you know, to make sure that everyone's kind of learning the same thing. And I think that that's part of the problem, right? And it's really hard to do at scale, which is why, you know, when you try to do it at scale, you end up with something like the education system, right? right. You cannot put everyone into a mold because we're all so different. You cannot force everyone to learn from the same curriculum because we're all so different. You cannot assess people all the same way because we're all so different. And so that's why I keep talking about diversity of approaches in the alternative education space. The problem is that that's hard. It's messy. It's chaotic. And it's risky, right? So that's why a lot of people are like, I don't even want to go there. But I would argue that that's how kid, you know, that's how we start to make a change, right? If what we're doing right now is not working, 
then we need to try something different, right? And it's not going to look perfect, but at least we have a better chance than doing what we've been doing for so many years. And I think that this is something that um, you guys are doing with synthesis, uh, synthesis, synthesis excuse me, um, and you're, you're, it's almost like specialized education. And so I feel like that's going to be, that's gonna, AI is going to help a lot with education in the future when it comes to giving specialized education to whoever uses it. How is um, AI going to revolutionize the education system in general? Yeah, so we're already starting to see this with um, digital tutors, right? So we at Synthesis are doing one that I think is incredible, but I know that there are other people also working on this. But what's so remarkable about this and different from all the other apps that you see that I would use as a teacher in school is that um, those apps are very much um, teaching for the standard, teaching for the test. And so they're very, you know, for the same outcome. When it comes to digital tutors, at least the ones that we're using at Synthesis is called a Synthesis Tutor, is we've actually grabbed all the elements of a human that make, you know, human tutors so effective. Because by the way, the most effective way to teach and learn is through a one-on-one -one tutoring. And this is the holy grail of education technology, which is how do we leverage technology so that everyone around the world can have their own personal Aristotle, right? Like one-on-one -on -one tutor. And so that's what we're trying to do. And that's where we're starting to be able to do with, with, the, with AI. Um, we, for example, the way we've done it at Synthesis is we've recorded somebody that we believe is the best math educator out there. We've spotted him. He has all the credentials. He's an excellent at the art of teaching. He's super interesting. He's so into his craft. He has the stories, the mannerism, the way he gives feedback. And we've recorded him for so many hours that we've been able to capture all the elements of his personality and put it into this digital tutor to the point where kids actually feel like they're talking to Dr. Tanton, who is the teacher, instead of an actual computer. And, you know, I've been through that. You can actually try it. If you go to synthesis.com slash tutor, you can actually learn. I think we have for free binary numbers. So you get to actually see how this works. And again, we're at the very early stages, right? Like, like we're, we're just getting started. Imagine what this will look like years from now and when we start to cover every subject. So we started with math, but the idea is that kids now have a teacher that's infinitely patient, right? That will stay there with you until you've mastered the content. So the biggest frustration for me as a teacher was not being able to sit down with every single student of mine that was struggling until they got the material. Why? Because I had 30 kids, because I had all this curriculum that I had to cover. I couldn't just stop and sit with them. Now with this, D, you know, AI tutors, they just stay with you until you've mastered the content. So you no longer have that problem that kids are moving on to the next grade with these gaps in knowledge, right? Which is, you know, you're setting them up for failure when you do that. Here, they, they're able to catch up and actually. So the other thing we're, we're starting to notice is the attitude of students that thought that they were not good at math is totally changing. And as you probably know, the way you think about things and your confidence in yourself has a lot to do with how you will absorb this content and how much attention you will pay. And so um, kids are now feeling way more optimistic about math, which is huge. They're starting to see the relevance of math and how they can apply it to the real world. And so imagine if we could actually cover the hardcore academics in an hour or two a day so kids could open up the rest of the day to engage in other things. Like that would be restoring back their childhood. And that to me would look like success when it comes to education. Something that we have in common um, is that I, I saw that you used to teach in Boston. I used to teach in Boston as well. Um, and I'm actually in Boston right now. Something I realized when I was there is that I would talk to the staff and the teachers and I would ask them how long they've been working there. And they would only tell me like one or two years. And then they would also mention that they're not coming back next year. And that's an issue because we're not, because it takes a while to understand the systems that schools have. And I felt like there was a lot of turnover. Like there was a lot of people going, coming and going. What is it that teachers are unsatisfied about? Obviously everyone knows that the pay is something that, that, um, that this is very common that people talk about is the pay is an issue. What else is an issue that teachers just aren't satisfied with their jobs and they're leaving? Absolutely. I, I, I love this question. So, um, a lot of, a, a lot of, um, I feel like most teachers, and I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, go into this profession for the right reasons. They want to work with kids. They want to be part of the people shaping the next generation. They want to, you know, double down on the things that they're great at and follow their curiosities and all this and all that. And when you become a teacher in a school, you know, in the traditional school system, you quickly realize that there's very little space for you to do the things that in your heart feel right. And, and to do the things, you know, um, when you go into this profession, you, I, I want to believe that you like kids, right? You need to like kids, right? And if you like kids, you get kids. You know the kind of things that spark their interest. You know the kind of things, you know that they are 
when they are interested in something, they can keep going for hours and they really retain the information and all this. So it's really discouraging when you're up there and you're you're forcing them to learn from, again, this curriculums that you yourself are wondering, like, why are we even teaching this? Like, when are they going to use this information? Every time they ask you, oh, when am I going to use this? And you're not having that answer. Or, you know, now with this whole obsession with standardized tests and, and having to teach for the test all the time, that's that doesn't feel good, right? So a lot of teachers feel trapped because you don't have an option. You know, you can kind of deviate from the curriculum. You can kind of play it off. And, but in the end of the day, you'll get fired if you don't give the homework, which I, don't, I, I never agreed with homework, but I had to give homework a lot of the times. I didn't agree with teaching for the test. And, and I did it for many years until I was finally like, I'm not doing it this year. Um, and but but, you know, there's so many things that you have to do that don't make sense. So that's one big one. In addition to the ones you've mentioned, which, of course, teachers don't get the recognition for the work. And like, I feel like teaching has become sort of like a fallback profession, right? When you don't know what to do or, you know, then you become a teacher. And it's like, wait, what? Like teachers have the most important job, which is helping shape the minds of the future. If you look at countries like Finland. Teaching is one of the most prestigious professions there, like even more than doctors and then lawyers. Why? Because they understand that they have the most important job. Right. And so they get paid really high salaries. They're looked upon with respect. In order to become a teacher, you have to be like top five percent of your class or something like that. Like it's really, you know, uh, something aspirational. How different is it in the U.S. and, you know, in Panama, where I'm from, Latin America, like in all these countries? It's like, no, it's, it's not like that. Then you mentioned the pay. Also, when you see all this money going to the education system and to fix the education system and you hear about it and then you're in the classroom and you see things falling apart and you see like, you know, you're like, where is this money going? Like, what's going on? And how little, you know, the teachers are the ones that are interacting every day with the kids and seeing how little saying they have over the policies and over the curriculums. And they're not the ones calling. They're not the ones calling the shots or at least have a voice in what should be taught and learned. And then you look at the people that are actually coming up with the curriculums and making up all these rules, and they know squat about education. Many of them are business people that really don't understand, you know, what it is that it takes to teach and learn. And so it's very discouraging. And then, again, with time, teachers have less time and space and, you know, because everything's so structured, not only for kids, but also for teachers, that we don't have the flexibility that we used to have to do things. And, and you know, and then our, our salaries are tied to performance. And again, sometimes the kids don't perform well, not because they don't know the material, just because they're not good test takers, but that's the only way we have to measure their progress. And so there are lots of things that are just not working. And, you know, teachers sometimes, like I, I was one of those teachers that would leave at 8 p.m. at night because I was like leaving the classroom and everything ready for the next day and prepping for all my lessons and this and that. And nobody recognized me. And I, I, it's not that I was expecting recognition for that, but we work hard. We work on the weekends, you know, and, and, and that obviously does not reflect on the pay. Um, although I would argue that a lot of people don't go into this profession for the money. But I, I just feel like in general, they feel trapped. They feel not acknowledged. And, and they sometimes don't have the resources to live, you know, not, not even like well, but like baseline, you know. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a big problem. What was your school experience like? And how, how, did, it, um, how did it change your opinions or um, mold your opinions on the school system and just... Just how, is, how has it made you think the way you think about the school system now? Yeah, so I, I was born in Panama, but due to my dad's job, I had to move around a lot. So by the time I was 14, I had been to 10 different schools in seven different countries, right, and continents. So we, you know, I was constantly the new girl. I was constantly trying to survive, and I had to pick up on what to do in order to adapt to this constant different academic environments and social environments, et cetera. And so I picked up on one in my book. I have a book that came out two weeks ago called The Learning Game. And it talks about the game of school and how so many kids are playing this game where, you know, you pick up on what to do in order to pass, in order to check all the boxes to appear as if you're learning and to pass the test, et cetera. But you're not really learning. And so the game is very familiar, right? You know when to raise your hand. You know when to be quiet. You know when not to question things, even though you kind of want to know. But you're like, no, I'll get in trouble. You know what to do to please your teachers. You know how to complete all those worksheets and how to pass the test in order to get, you know, the school learning out of the way and then actually engage in the things that you enjoy, which is where I would argue that actual learning happens. This usually happens outside of school when you're not being worried about being judged and you're actually doing the things that kids are meant to do, which are exploring and being curious about stuff and asking questions and et cetera, et cetera. 
And so I did this over and over again. I played this game until I graduated from high school. Um, I was very lucky that I had parents that um, were very present and they made sure that the time that I was spending outside of school was very well spent. How? Like nurturing my curiosity, letting me explore all the things that I wanted, making me believe that I could reach, you know, the sky if I worked really hard in the things that I was passionate about. And so I had a natural way of explaining things in a way that captured people's attention. I loved to talk and I loved um, to wor work with other people. So I was like, I, I want to become an educator. I would love to work with kids. They're so curious. They're fun. Um, and, and I just feel like this is something that's well, my, my time is well spent. And then I went to NYU and I started childhood education, special education and psychology. And when I was doing my student teaching there, they, they make you go, you know, spend time. I think it's 200 hours in different classrooms with different teachers, um, different schools around the city. And that's when it dawned on me when I was looking at the students and I saw that they were playing the game of school. They were not engaged in what they were doing. They were not retaining the information. They were all playing this game just to get the school out of the way. I recognized the game. I was an expert in it myself. I hadn't realized that it was universal. And that's when I started to notice where we're stuck in education. Kids are stuck in the game of school, imitating their teachers instead of learning how to think for themselves, filling out worksheets and learning to pass a test instead of learning how to solve real problems, and just mimicking and, and following directions instead of learning how to figure things out for themselves and how to become lifelong learners. And so that was an oh moment for me. I was like, you know, like, like I, am I in the wrong place? Like, but I was like, no, I'll do things differently when I have my classroom. And to a certain extent, I did. You know, I tried my best to create an environment where kids actually wanted to show up every day and they were excited to be there. I tried to deviate from the curriculum in order to teach the things that they were already curious and interested in. I tried to do things differently. And I think that I, I did a good job. My kids were very happy in my classroom and they seemed to enjoy the things that we were doing. However, as they went on to different grades, and even when they had great teachers, a lot of them would start to play the game of school again. And they would fall out, in, out of love with learning again. And they started to dread things that they used to love, like writing and math and reading. And so I was like, well, what's going on? And that's when I realized, when I started questioning and sort of like going back and trying to understand like what's happening, young kids have this innate desire to learn. That's how we're born. That's how we're wired. The problem is that they suddenly um, are put into school, into this like structured environments when they no longer have choices over the topics that they're learning, the way they are assessed, you know, the time that they're assessed, like they suddenly have no choice over something that should be completely optional, right? That, that uh, you know, those options is what makes kids want to continue doing what they're doing, which is learning. And so, um, of course, they lose interest. Of course, they stop playing the game of learning and start playing the game of school. And so many of them never stop to question this. And a lot of them graduate, you know, again, not knowing what they're good at, what they love doing, um, just kind of like no idea where they want to take their life. Like, what's my next step? And so that's when I kind of realized, uh-oh, you know, I, I, I don't know what we're going to do because it's really hard to change this entity. It's really hard for one individual to make things go in a different direction for all the reasons that we've talked about. And so I said, you know, I, I, I think I'm better off trying to find alternatives outside of the system. So I left in 2015. And ever since then, I've been, you know, writing about my my experiences and about the, the things that I've been doing research on and based on, you know, the things that we are discovering at synthesis, which is, you know, I was at, you know, in, in the one end of the spectrum, the very traditional school system, and now I'm kind of at the edge of innovation in this um, education startup. And so I've been documenting all that. And I feel like my experience growing up was kind of a springboard for me to want to change things. And so again, I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, in my book, The Learning Game, I talk about a lot of these things. And I ask a lot of these questions. And the whole goal of the book is to make people um, reflect on their educational experiences and hopefully rethink education for themselves and start to sort of realize that there are alternatives or different ways of doing things, even if you can't pull your kids out of the system. And so that's the whole point of what, what I'm doing now. And I do think that my childhood experience in all the schools um, has had a big impact on what I do today. Yeah, what, what gives me hope is that there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of people with your story out there that went through that traditional system and they just see that it doesn't work. And that gives me hope that when those people are the ones that are eventually uh, making decisions that hopefully we'll see some change. Um, so I want to transition a little bit to just learning in general. So we talked about how um, the school system kind of fails to 
actually make the kids like learn, like deep learn the stuff that they're um, teaching in class. What are some key things that we can do to to be better at learning um, so we can actually retain information and actually learn? Because right now I feel like the school system is not doing a good job at that. Absolutely. So it goes back to this idea of instead of focusing on the content, um, and this is something that originally I thought about when e- Elon Musk was like, well, he saw the same problem that we all see with the, with, with the school system. And he was like, it doesn't make any sense that we are teaching all this topics that kids are then forgetting. It would be a much better approach is to pose them a big problem. And then as they're engaged in the problem, which is a lot more fun, they're going to need tools and they're going to need knowledge and information. And that's the moment where you introduce them to that or where you tell them where they can find that. Because suddenly that tool or that knowledge has relevance. They can see why they need that. And I realize that that's key to learn. You need to understand why you need this and you you need to want that in order to move on to the next step, whether it is a video game, whether it is a problem, whatever it is, like you need that information and that's when it sticks. So that's one thing. The other thing is choice. It sounds very like cliche, but it's, I swear it works like magic. When you give kids choices, you can, it's it's incredible. Like even, you know, my students who said, I hate reading, I'm never going to read, like this is just not my thing. When you suddenly gave them choices, like, yes, you can read a magazine if you want. Yes, you can read Captain Underpants 10 times if you want. Yes, you can grab that comic book. Like it doesn't matter as long as you're reading. What you start to notice is first they're going to read the garbage kind of stuff, which is like what people... But then they fall in love with the actual like, oh, I have a choice. I can actually do it. They start to see that they learn things. And then they start to pick up. And you would see this kid picking up the more challenging books or, you know, starting to expand their interest and the kind of things that they were reading. And it's because of the choice. And so I think that when you give people the choice, um, then you start to see very different outcomes. Um, Then what we talked about earlier as well, that we know that learning is interconnected. So when you give kids a problem or a project, that's why I'm I'm such a big fan of project-based learning. Because again, you start to see how math fits into science, how social studies plays a role in this reading assignment. And so that's how, you know, learning is interconnected. That's how things click into place. The other thing that's super important that we don't realize often is that we need a lot of downtime for creative ideas and for learning to consolidate. And so if you think about, you know, let's again, looking at kids' schedule, it's so packed. You know, they have back to back to back, like after being eight hours in school or seven hours in school, then they have soccer, then they have chess, then they have this, then they have homework, and then they get home, they're exhausted, family time, going to bed. When do they have time to just sit down and linger with their ideas? You know, It's very rare, and we know that this is crucial in order for learning to actually happen and for them, again, to have those creative insights and for ideas to consolidate. And so kids need more just downtime to be bored by inactivity and for things to be, you know, they need days sometimes for it to be like, oh, I remember this. This is how this fits here. Like that's, for example, how I write, right, and how I get those creative insights because I need to let those ideas marinate for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months. And then I'm like, ooh, breakthrough insight, you know? And so I think that the same is true for kids and for adults, by the way. A lot of the things that I talk about, I say kids because I look at everything through the lens of kids, but it's applicable to adults as well. And so those are three things that are that come to mind that are very simple that anyone can do, but that we sometimes overlook. So I feel like the school system isn't a very good, accurate representation of what life is like after. Um, this is coming from someone who graduated college um, a couple of years ago. What are some keys to success after college, after um, your education? Um, what are some keys to, to, um, to actually succeed in the real world? Yeah, so so in my book, I talk about two things that, that I encourage parents to start doing with their kids since they're little. But I, I, I started, you know, this is something that adults can do if they haven't already, if their parents haven't helped them with this. But one is range and the other one is specific knowledge. So the idea of range that I learned from David Epstein, this author that has a book called Range, talks about the importance of trying many, many different things when you're young um, and quitting the ones that you don't end up liking or you're not good at but in order to realize the ones that you are good at. And and that exposure to a diverse, you know, sometimes parents are like, oh, I want my, my, my child to be a pro in soccer. So I'm only going to enroll him in soccer or her in soccer for, you know, every day a week or whatever, this and that. But the reality is that the best soccer players, the best basketball players, the, the you know, if you look at Nobel Prize winners, if you look at scientists, what they have in common is that they have 
they're very good at many different things. They, they come from a generalist background because they've had a chance to explore different fields and different sports and different things. And then that's what makes them eventually really good at what they do. So one of the things that I say is give yourself an opportunity to experience a bunch of different things um, because you will get some insights that, that you didn't know before, but also because eventually they make you really good at whatever it is that you're going to specialize on. For me, for example, if you if you look at my work and if you read my writing, I, I talk a lot about ideas in entrepreneurship, in finance, in business world, in gaming, in sports. Why? Because that's where I get my inspiration. And that's when I start to see connections. Like you don't really see me often reading education books because that would make my writing boring. I wouldn't have any you know, creative insights, right? It's when I read about other fields and other things that I'm like, ah, here's where the good stuff comes. So I think it's the same for adults and for kids. So generalize first, and then you will realize what you're really good at or what you have this, you know, passion for or what you can, you know, Naval Ravikant, this entrepreneur and angel investor, he talks about specific knowledge, which is find what feels like play to you, but looks like work to others. That's where the magic happens, because when it feels like play to you, you're willing to put in hours and hours and hours to it because it feels like play, right? But it feels like work to other people. So I would say after you've given yourself a chance to try many different things and expose yourself to many different areas that are out of your comfort zone, but with this mentality of I'm here to learn, I'm not here to be an expert, then you'll find what you can then specialize in and double down on, and that's your specific knowledge. And by the way, talking to your parents about this is very useful because it usually starts at a very young age, but we sometimes don't realize. So maybe you can ask your parents, like, what's something that I was super drawn to when I was a kid that I could talk for hours for, that I was naturally inclined to? And usually you can start to see the connections. And so generalize first, specialize later. And, you know, that that gives you a creative advantage. And then the other thing I would say, and this is something that I learned late in life is the power of compounding. Whatever it is that you decide to do, if you kind of see, you know, again, I wrote a book and it wasn't something that I did like, oh, I want to write a book. Let me sit down and let me start writing from zero. No, it's something that I started to write a newsletter every Friday. And after three, three and a half years, I was like, oh my God, I have all these articles that I've been sending out every Friday. I could turn this into a book. And that's what I did. And so that's an example of compounding. And I've realized the power of this, and this is something that I want to teach my kids since they're young, do something every day that compounds, you know, and you, you can see this, the, the, the most common example is the gym, right? Like if you want to be fit, you start going to the gym every day, every day, every day, eventually you are very fit. So it's the same thing for everything. And so, you know, this is something that I usually tell to teenagers when they're like, well, I'm, I'm like, find something that you're passionate about that you're willing to spend hours on and do a little bit of that every day, even if you don't know where this is going, you know, just do that every day. And the last thing is something I learned from one of my good friends, Polina Maranova. She's the author of Hidden Genius. Highly recommend this book. Um, she says, anything you do, do it under your name because your name is something that nobody can take away from you. And so regardless of where you go, if they fire you from this company or if this or that or whatever, if you do it under your name, nobody can take that away from you. So those are sort of the things that I would say. What would you say are some of the biggest regrets from your 20s? Are you still in your 20s, by the way? No, I'm 32. Okay. All right, so what would you say? Yeah. yeah. So so good question. Wow. Okay. So I mentioned my parents earlier and they and I mentioned all the great things that they did. Um, one thing that I guess they did not prioritize um, teaching me at home and I certainly did not learn in school is um, financial literacy and, and, you know, knowing how to save my money and where to put my money and, and mo more than that, just the mentality the psychology behind money, which, by the way, one of the books that changed my life was Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Again, a book that I would recommend to anybody from a very young age, um, because understanding really the principles behind it's not just like, oh, money. No, no, there's a whole psychological aspect to it that I unfortunately learned very late in life. And I didn't quite like pay attention to that. And it goes back to the things that we're teaching kids in school and how we're not teaching the practical things like financial literacy and how to, you know, use and spend your money and how to think about money. And so that's something that I regret, that I that I kind of wish that I had had this mentality of saving earlier on and and where to spend my money. And I mean, I turned out fine, but but I feel like like things could have been different had I done this. And especially because I'm very conscious about this now that I have a child, I want to make sure that he learns this at an early age. 
Um, so I'm trying to think, how do I teach this, considering that it's something that I, I didn't quite learn and that I'm just starting to learn on my own now as an adult. Kind of related to this, let's say you had a minute with your younger self. What would you tell her? Ooh. I would tell her, stop trying to fit in. Yeah. So I would tell my younger self, stop trying to fit in. Um, I think that growing up and having to move so much and it, you know, it, it, my default state was trying to fit in, seeing what everybody was doing and try to copy that. And again, this is something that the education system really reinforces. It teaches everyone to follow the same path and everyone to do the same thing. And whoever does things differently gets in trouble and are the troublemakers and the rebels. Um, something I realized as an adult that I wish I had realized earlier was no, like you should, you know, try to stand out and it's okay to be different. And it's actually the world rewards people who carve their own paths and who think differently and who break from the pack, you know? Um, and, and I kind of wish I knew this earlier and I kind of wish that I had seeked to hang out with the kids that were not the conventionally minded um, thinkers, right? But um, the independent thinkers, because that's where learning really happens and growth really happens. And so I would tell that to my younger self.